Hello, my name is Adeline Tice, and I am a master's student with the Department of Biological Sciences at Minnesota State University, Mankato. Last month, I defended my thesis online, and in the mass chaos of me trying to do that, I forgot to record the presentation. So this video here is a brief introduction to the findings of my research that I concluded while uh, I measured the opinions and knowledge of visitors of Minneopa State Park. Um, just a little brief introduction about me and my background in prairie started with my degree um, from MSU in plant sciences where I focused on Minnesota prairie systems. And during that time I had experience gained um, with the prairie systems working with the Shakopee, Midwalk, and Sioux and their land department serving prairies. I published my own field guide of prairie plants found in the local Mankato area, worked with local chapters of the Prairie Enthusiast Club, uh, Group, and volunteered with the Department of Ma uh, natural resources for Minnesota uh, out at the park, at Minneopolis State Park. Uh, in 2017, I started the fall again at MSU, um, but continuing my education and earning a degree of uh, master's in science in uh, biology education, where the fo focus is uh, public education or public outreach rather than uh, like the K through 12 uh, education. So now that my research uh, and education is completed, I have spent uh, two seasons at Forestville Mystery Cave State Park as a seasonal interpreter and look forward to continuing my work there as well as I participated in a internship at Riverbend Nature Center in Faribault and so I'm interested in public outreach opportunities in a variety of ways so if you have any questions about my research or any um, public outreach opportunities feel free to email me further but thank you for listening to my presentation I'm going to continue on and start um, my explanation for the development and implementation of the PACS my survey uh, instrument I designed to measure the public knowledge attitude specifically about prairie ecosystems before we get into the details of the survey and all that data, I'm going to start very broad and we're going to just start to talk about the general system of prairies in Minnesota. Um, and so when the first settlers came to Minnesota, four distinct biomes were described of the state. To the north, the coniferous forest is full of needles, dominant trees that grow tall above the bogs and lake below. That's that orange color. The deciduous forest is found in the middle of our state, that light blue color and has streams and rivers that flow through the historically known Big Woods area. And to the west is the endless sky and prairie. That yellow section on the, the figure, the tall grass aspen prairie, it's a unique biome because of the dry, windy prairie to the west and the moist, cold, coniferous forest to the east. So today when I'm talking about tall grass prairies, I will be referring to this green portion of the state rather than yellow. The prairie grassland biome is an extensive area of flat or rolling grassland. Almost 18 million acres of prairie grassland cover the southwest parts of the state before European expansion occurred. In Minnesota, these grasslands range from a variety of systems. They can look like sparsely vegetated sand dunes to vast big blue stem up to almost eight feet tall from wet meadows to even short grass prairies high on the bluffs uh, like in uh, on the Mississippi and the Minnesota River. Um, so with this diversity of ecosystem, the list of flora and fauna that are found here are extensive. Today in 2020, Minnesota is comprised of 58.3 million acres with around 5.5 million people who call this state home. Animals, cropland, homes, and businesses fill our state. Habitat loss is one of the largest problems for prairie systems that occurs through development. Today, tall grass prairies are the most endangered ecosystem in the world with less than 1% of the original range remaining. The rate of grassland destruction is largely exceeding their protection as most biomes of grasslands are listed as critically endangered. From this figure uh, here, you can see the gray color, the light gray, is currently agriculture found in 2011, but this was originally prairie. Degradation and reduction of prairie ecosystems can have numerous consequences, and so based on the services that these prairie systems provide. There is a direct value to prairie ecosystem protection and conservation. But how does conservation occur in Minnesota? Well, let's go through that.
How conservation in Minnesota occurs is through a few ways. Environmental education provides access to information on uh, what's occurring in the state, which then hopefully will make environmentally literate citizens, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but those are citizens that are going to be, you know, uh, pro-environmental making those decisions. Otherwise, we can also have people that private support, like the prayer enthusiast, who help do donate or make private land into prairie systems. Either way, funds are necessary for this to occur. Um, the public support can then relate to policy making um, that will then dictate more funds than uh, go to successful conservation. So either way, successful conservation can occur. It's just there's different routes that can take to get there. Earlier, I mentioned the term environmental literacy, and so I just want to kind of go through that and explain um, what I mean by that. The main goal of environmental education is to change an individual's behavior or to establish environmentally literate citizens that make pro-environmental behaviors. Pro-environmental behaviors, um, those are those that seek, uh, consciously seek to minimize the negative impacts on one's actions on nature. So um, bringing a reusable water bottle, um, taking a shorter shower, those kind of things. While environmental literacy, this is a concept or the, this ability to comprehend environmental issues and how human activities affect the environment. So understanding that um, relationship between a human and the environment. The importance of environmental literacy is communicating the issues of environmental degradation to the public, as well as having uh, education drive change in attitudes as well as behaviors. So then how does an individual form a behavior? Because that's the overall goal of environmental education, right? And this is where the project kind of shifts gears because um, now we are focusing more on the psychology. How is a decision even created? Well, traditionally we thought that this occurred by um, a knowledge creating an attitude or awareness, which then would lead to an action, this kind of linear creation of an attitude. But um, further research has gone to find this uh, isn't necessarily true. New research has come out has found knowledge isn't the most important aspect in the creation of a behavior, but rather there's other um, factors contributing to this and a lot of things that haven't been measured before. So, um, you know, your family's value toward nature can impact your connection to nature. Um, how close you grew up to nature may affect your connection to nature. Things that necessarily, um, not every person has experienced the same. And so this is gonna be one of those aspects that made this project harder is because a lot of these aspects are hard to control for uh, in a population. Knowledge is still important in the creation of your behavior. It's just not the only factor that was originally thought to contribute to this. So uh, multiple studies have shown that there's this association of it, but there's other uh, methods to create this connection to nature. One of these methods to increase interest of endangered ecosystems um, are flagship species, um, or otherwise known as popular charismatic species. Um, they serve as symbols or almost rallying points to stimulate conservation awareness and action within a given ecosystem. You've probably already even seen flagship species being used. Some environmental agency, they found this unique way to spark interest with the public, um, aka to increase factors that create pro-environmental behaviors. And so they promote conservation in a time where the experience of nature is neglected and the public needs something that they can relate to as well as value um, and connect to somebody's uh, sympathy. So, uh, for example, the panda bear is very charismatic and an emotional species um, to the human per perception. So um, a supporting tool in conservation management is incorporating that aspect of both emotional and value characters as well as knowledge-based information um, and that works well uh, as being a conservation or a fa like flagship species. Now, as we circle back to prairies, I see the use of bison as a flagship species for the for prairie education and conservation. Um, they fit the general characteristics of flagship species. They are large, charismatic megafauna. Um, they are the largest mammal found in this system, and they also provide 
restorative processes for uh, prairie conservation. So many of these systems, as they age, they need help with this disturbance. Um, fire only can do so much, so having these big, large grazers is a benefit if there is enough land for them. Um, and so Minnesota actually has access to bison herds throughout the state through the Minnesota Bison Conservation Herd. Miniopa State Park is the second bison herd location site uh, in the state after Blue Mound State Park. Miniopa was an important site added because this location includes an established prairie remnant that actually was in need of herbivores for their prairie restoration against the woody vegetation, vegetation that is uh, overgrowing the area. Um, but this site is also less than 100 miles from the metro area and can provide high traffic uh, to visitors to the park for then a larger um, group of, po of people to educate this uh, need for prairies too. Now I want to start talking about my specific project and the research questions associated with it. And so overall my goal was to characterize the public's knowledge, attitude, and values of prairies just because there is no information uh, on that. And as we just found out, it is important to know uh, how the public feels about this because it will relate to the actual end result of conservation that actually occurs in the state. These bullet point questions are very specific questions to help break down this very broad question. Um, something this complex, it needs to be broken down into hopefully easy to answer questions. Um, the first one, what are the values, attitudes, and knowledge of Minneopa State Park visitors in relation to prairie and prairie conservation? Um, then we're going to look at those values and how there's a relationship between them. Um, then we're going to be looking at what aspects of visiting state parks are and engaging in uh, conservation efforts uh, are encouraging and discouraging. We're going to look at visitor demographics and the relationship between their attitudes, as well as look at people who visit a state park like Miniopa State Park. What is their differences in uh, values, attitudes, and knowledge to people that don't visit or non-park visitors? So, wow, a lot of questions. How are we going to answer that? Um, well, first, we need to develop and validate a survey because there is no other survey out there looking at these kind of questions. And so from there, once we validate the survey, we can implement the survey on a certain population group. So as we go through the design and implementation of the survey, um, I'm going to be using this flowchart to help kind of visualize um, the steps taken to get to actually implementing the survey. So um, the very first step after you know, getting a research question was reviewing the primary literature and interviewing with ex experts in the field. So studies investigating the public's perception can be challenging and the results showcase the complexity of environmental issues. And so for the development of my own survey, a literature review was conducted that included consulting uh, existing research on survey development and implementation uh, specifically related to individuals' views of conservation and environmental behaviors as well as attitudes about conservation. So then after I kind of looked at as many surveys as I could, I created my first draft of a survey instrument. And so originally the first draft of the survey included two parts. Um, the part one is the Likert scale, which is like agree or disagree. Uh, and then a second was a multiple choice section. Um, and we'll go and you'll see a breakdown of the survey in a little bit, and I'll explain more. But originally it was just two parts. We hypothesized really two constructs um, that would kind of fall out of our data from um, our part one of the survey, while well, the last one is just a knowledge question, so kind of three. And here you can see um, how each question that is asked on part one, how it's, uh, how we thought it would hypothesize into the constructs, um, and then the sources where we got that question from. The first version of our survey that we created was implemented to undergraduate students enrolled in Biology 106 which is a general biology course um, that bio majors will take. Um, and this occurred during the spring of 2018. 
The population that was used for this preliminary uh, implementation allowed access to a population who would be familiar with biological content, conservation, and um, they were expected to have an interest in nature. So we are aware of that, but we needed people to take our survey to see if we had any repetitive questions, um, because at this point it was quite long. After we collected the data from our first uh, group of students, we did a first round of factor analysis. This is the first validation process that has occurred on our survey instrument so far, and we are using principal access factoring as our extraction method. Um, and this is because it focuses on the common variance that exists between items or our questions, as well as allowing for the reduction of these questions in targeting the variables that this study aimed to measure. Um, and so um, principal access factoring, it's, it's more commonly used in behavioral and social sciences, but its aim is to understand a shared variance in a series of measurements through sets of hidden variables and gives its best results when working with non-normal data, which is what this kind of data type is. Um, Principal access factoring is a form of exploratory factoral analysis, which allow for the exploration of the structure of our questions to determine if there are statistically associations within the construct that the study was aiming to measure. After the first round of factor analysis, we were able to get rid of some questions and come back with a second draft of our survey instrument that was a little more efficient and a little shorter. Um, and then from there, we implemented onto a second group. The second group to take our survey was an upper level biology course at MSU Animal Behavior. Um, this population provided similar qualities to the population before. Um, their interest in nature, uh, familiar with biology, but since this was an upper level course, the population was expected to have a more developed understanding and be more knowledgeable about the topic. It was also important to us to use a different population than those who completed the first version since those individuals would already be familiar with the instrument. Similar analysis was performed on the second version uh, of the survey as on the first. However, no difference in how analysis was conducted um, besides that the knowledge questions were removed prior to analysis. Uh, the decision to remove the knowledge questions uh, from the analysis occurred because these statements are not designed or to measure these the same variables as the constructs as before. The knowledge statements um, are evaluated using Spearman's row, which is a non-parametric uh, metric test that measures the strength of the associations between variables. After the second round of factorial analysis, um, we cleaned it up a bit for the final draft of our survey instrument, so I focused on the multiple choice questions and um, the response options, as well as improvements that were made to modify existing wording, reduce ambig uh, ambiguity, clarify questions. Uh, certain questions were reduced and made unbiased to not skew participants' responses. And the final part of the survey consisted of, dem uh, of a demographic questionnaire that was added. And this information was added just so that it allows for the analysis of any relationships between a participant's response and their demographic background. And finally, this led to the creation of PACS, otherwise known as the Prairie Attitude Knowledge Survey. And this is the final draft of our survey instrument. Now we're going to look specifically at the final survey. This is part one of PACS, and you can see it has the Likert scale, the strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. These are the options the participant can choose as they are going through the questions. Um, the questions are some of them are knowledge or um, asking about their values. Part two it consists of eight questions. Um, we can only fit four on a screen, so this is the first four. And you can see there are automatic responses that are already there. This is to allow for a quick, easy survey um, to be given out to people. They could fill it out quickly. Uh, this was one of the things that was tweaked during our um, survey development. And here are the remaining four for part two of PACS. So this is a section that they can come and fill out. Um, some of them are looking at encouraging factors, discouraging factors to visiting parks, as well as participating in prairie conservation, as well as who is in charge of conservation or who is the one that should be looking at that or 
you know, how can And then it be the final achieved? part of our survey is part three, and this is the demographic section where it just goes through um, basic questions to help us understand what types of people are visiting the park, um, as well as different things that might relate to the connection to nature. We just took a final look at the PAC survey. Now after the completion of the survey development, it's time to implement that survey on our population, which is Miniopa State Park. Let me tell you a little bit about the park first. Miniopa State Park is located 10 miles south of Mankato, Minnesota, and it serves as an ideal study site to apply the PACs to. The park draws visitors through several attractions, like the waterfall and hiking trails and now the reintroduction herd of bison. In 2015, a herd of bison was established through the Minnesota Bison Conservation Herd, and the park has seen significant increase in visitors. You can see on the graph the dark gray represents after the bison were introduced and the visitor uh, uh, population spiked. Bison were once found throughout the state of Minnesota, but the last wild bison was seen in 1880. Bison are classified as a near-threatened species because of the small number of bison that are managed for the preservation of the species. Only 20% of bison in the United States are managed for their genes. So to answer my research question, I implemented the survey at Miniopa State Park. Um, and to do so, I am thankful of the Bison Ambassador, um, this program that helped educate the public about bison um, as a way for me to ask people to participate in my research. And so using this kind of hands-on um, table to interact with the public, I was then able to ask them if they would wanna take a survey um, with me. And then from there I can go on and ask about how if they saw the bison as they came into the park and their experience so far. Data was collected from the state park from June 2018 to August 2018. Uh, 99 face-to-face -face surveys were completed at the park with an 89 percent response bit rate which I was actually surprised I was anticipating people not to want to take my survey at all. After the collection of the Miniopa State Park visitor data, I wanted a comparison group to be able to um, compare my data to non-park visitors. In order to make comparison between the Miniopa State Park visitor group and the general public, a second site was utilized of participants that were not at Miniopa State Park. And this was from adults visiting campus during the high school, middle school, regional science fair in 2019. Survey data was collected on February 16, 2019, and approve, uh, approval for the study was obtained by the IRB and the, the uh, people in charge of the science fair. 21 face-to-face -face surveys were completed with actually a little bit of a higher response rate from this uh, group, but that's also probably because of the small sample size that we actually got from this comparison group. So we have all of our data collected from both groups, and it's time to start to answer those questions that we asked ourselves at the beginning of this presentation. So this table right now, uh, table four, it is showing the four factors or the four constructs that actually um, came out of our data from part one of our uh, survey. And so if we remember at the beginning, we only hypothesized that we thought there were going to be two constructs, but actually there are four different. So what does that mean? Well, that just means evaluating conservation and behavior is more complicated than we uh, anticipated. And so other research have actually found many more uh, factors, but there's also a lot of differences in population, which can also result in that. This is figure six, and it takes the four factors that we established in the previous slide and applies them how they relate to the knowledge scores of participants. So you can see uh, for one, four, and three factors, as you um, have a higher or, or more pro-environmental behavior, you'll have a higher knowledge score. And so for two, it seemed like it might be flipped, like two has a negative relationship, but um, you remember this was data on the Likert scale, so it's either like uh, a disagree 
uh, strongly disagree or strongly agree. So if you were pro-environmental behavior and you were putting uh, for questions that were falling into one, three, and four, you'll probably say strongly agree. But because uh, factor two had questions that might say strongly disagree, it's flipped. Even though it has a negative relationship, it still means that uh, it has this relationship with knowledge. As you increase your knowledge, you'll be more pro-environmental behavior. So overall participants, they fall into kind of these two groups. Um, individual views or values related to nature and conservation can be characterized on a value orientation dichotomy scale. Uh, there are two main views. Personally, I believe it is more on a scale uh, rather than two distinct groups. Um, so you can see domination or individuals believe wildlife should be managed for human benefit and they prioritize human well-being over wildlife in their attitudes and behavior while mutualism are more individuals that view wildlife as part of their extended family that are deserving of rights and cares. And so um, the PACS instrument included statements that align with the features of both these orientations. And based on the data collected in the study, responses seem to align with mostly a mutualism-based ideology for the visitor group. Um, but our study also shows that not all participants fall into one or the other value-orientated categories. Before we start to compare the Minneopa Park visitors to the non-park visitors, we need to talk about that they are not a true comparison group for many reasons. Um, while we review this data, we at least may use it as a trend, but not necessarily a significance uh, for sure. Keep in mind that the sample size uh, of each group were very different between the populations in that uh, the responses for the non-visitors on PAC show more diversity than the visitor group. Non-visitor responses indicate a more dominating view towards land use compared to those who visited the park. And non-visitors still valued prairie ecosystems even though their previous experience in nature and more specifically a prairie was different for each individual. Here is figure seven, which is a bar chart that shows uh, the light gray visitors to non -gray, uh, dark gray, which is the non-visitors, uh, and over the four factors evaluated by part one of PACS. Um, and so you can see I only found one factor that was significantly different, and I found this interesting. And I was also surprised that non-visitor value na natural spaces, but then their personal opinion on how land should be used is different. So um, that's interesting to see. You can see knowledge wasn't different between groups as well. I know it's kind of a, a lot on one page, but this is table five showing our uh, responses for our part one of PACS, that a Likert scale for both the visitors and non-visitors. You can see the questions are colored based on what construct that they fit into. Um, and then I highlighted a few that I just thought were interesting to talk about. And so overall participants response on the PACS, they showed consistently positive, uh, positive environmental views. Although 90% of response indicated that participants are worried about environmental issues, fewer, fewer agreed that conservation is important even if it lowers people's standard of living. Almost all participants value living in a community with natural attractions and enjoying spending time with nature. And then my thing that I found was the most interesting is that almost all participants agreed that prairie ecosystems should be preserved. Figure 7 shows the responses from question 2, which was, what encourages you to visit a state park in a prairie ecosystem? The highest response you can see was quite a few things. Wildlife viewing, trails and hiking, uh, spending time with friends and family, and enjoying nature. All of these things are actually found in other literature as well, saying uh, the same things for other parks, that spending time with friends and family as well as uh, seeing nature was the reasons for visiting. Figure 8 shows the responses from the question 3 of part 2 and is the question asking what discourages you from visiting a state park located in a prairie ecosystem and you can see the responses distance, pests and insects and weather conditions were some of the, the biggest things for uh, discouraging them from visiting a state park. Figure 10 shows the number of responses to question 5, which was what would encourage you to participate in prairie conservation or restoration, and the number one result or uh, response was positive impact on the environment. 
I was anticipating learning experience. Um, so to see positive impact uh, was great to see. Figure 11 shows the number of responses to question six, which was what would discourage you to participate in prairie conservation and restoration? And the number one response was time demand, which uh, to me is not a surprise because most people are very busy with their lives already. So to ask them of their selves and of a very physical task sometimes uh, is impressive to see the result we do get anyway. So time demand being the number one thing that discourages people to participate in prairie conservation. We're going to move on now to the discussion part of the presentation where we look at what we found in this research and how it applies to the general field and what information is already out there. So we're going to start uh, first start talking about our knowledge of our visitors. Overall, the participants in the study answered the knowledge questions correctly. I was a little, uh, a little hesitant. I was expecting um, people not to understand or know much about prairies, but uh, participants, they could identify the specific facts about them, but the big thing is that they couldn't understand uh, necessarily the specific function. And we kind of found this, uh, uh, other researchers have found this, and it aligns with Lyman clan. They, they found people have general knowledge specifically to the ecology of prairie dogs, but when it comes to the specifics about the prairie dogs, their knowledge, it wasn't extensive. Um, and also, uh, aldermen in 2000 found visitors were more knowledgeable than the public about conservation-related uh, issues, but visitors only had marginal understanding of environmental issues related to local ecosystems. And this was talking um, about an aquarium in Baltimore. And so it's interesting to see um, that our population falls into kind of the same, same boat all the other research has, but... Um, it would be interesting to see um, more detailed information or more advanced knowledge questions given to the participants and seeing how they done. But however, the goal of this study was to measure the public's general understanding of prairies. So asking higher level questions wasn't, uh, wouldn't have not been appropriate. So uh, for future reference um, or for future research, uh, more advanced knowledge could be done in this area to look further into this. So looking at knowledge versus visitors' packs, we found a significant relationship between knowledge and all uh, factors measured by the packs. For all relationships, visitors who tended to be more environmentally focused are also tended to be more knowledgeable about prairies. Uh, these results support my hypothesis about relationship between knowledge and value of nature to prairie ecosystem. Highlights, this specifically highlights that connection of knowledge and conservation. Um, so what we did find though, the implications of this is that education level is not related to knowledge score, um, being, which is just that being knowledgeable about prairies and prairie conservation is not the result of formal education. Although uh, it was not the goal of the study to determine where knowledge was developing from, it is possible that this knowledge develops from other sources uh, than formal education which I think is really interesting because w where is it coming from? And that could be a whole nother research project is identifying where this uh, information is coming from and where is the public learning it. Conservation knowledge can de develop through a combination of long-term ecological understanding and a big thing is learning from crises and mistakes, which I would not enjoy or I would not prefer people learn from their the mistakes, environmental mistakes and uh, crises, but rather uh, learn before those uh, events occur. And now on to encouraging and discouraging factors of visitors. We found the main factors that encouraged someone to visit a state park located in a prairie ecosystem was spending time with family and friends, enjoying nature, as well as wildlife viewing. Um, similar results found at a provincial park in Canada, as well as Great Smoky Mountains uh, National Park, established similar objectives as well. The main factors that discouraged someone to visiting a state park located in a prairie ecosystem was distance, pest insects, and weather conditions. A lot of these things uh, the park can't control for, um, so it's something that would be hard to actually change. Um, but it's interesting to see that distance is a problem for discouraging factors of visitors in Minnesota. Minnesota is set up special. Um, 
It's set up so every citizen only has to travel a max of 50 miles to get to a state park. You can look at this map and see the uniform arrangement. It is on purpose to prevent long distances to the parks so that the parks, this public land is distributed to the public. Uh, everyone can visit it then. It is important to understand what may encourage and discourage visitors from participating in conservation or visiting natural areas such as state parks because engagement has become almost the lifeblood of environmental movements. Um, what we found in this research is that top encouraging factors for volunteering in prairie conservation was having a positive impact on community and engagement in learning experiences, that, that's important, as well as the top discouraging factors for volunteering in prairie conservation was the time demand, the distance to travel there, as well as even weather conditions. Um, something that I did have is, or I did notice in the field is that uh, prairie conservation or the process of it isn't necessarily in inclusive, especially for the disability community. A lot of these projects are physical demand uh, necessary um, to do these projects. So it'd be interesting to uh, incorporate more people into this project into different ways like sea collecting, um, which isn't as labor intensive as maybe mechanical disruption or even burning can be. The engagement to volunteers uh, has the potential to preserve, build, and restore significant environmental and civic capacity of local communities. So engagement in volunteering or visiting state parks, it can also indicate behavioral changes as well as the potential for value orientation shift. So if you're seeing your population or your community um, visiting these places or they're in higher demand, it might be uh, an indicator for your population, how their values are. And now looking at the relationships of visitors' demographics and the views of prairies and conservation, um, what we found is visitors were mostly mutualistic. Um, there was no significant difference between male versus female, uh, which some research showed that female were more likely to be found to be pro-environmental or mutualistic uh, in their views. Uh, what we also found was 20 to 30 year olds were more mutualistic than 31 to 45 year olds, saying that there was a significant relationship between age and personal conservation, specifically that's factor one. Responses for intent for nature are factor two, and land use fac value factor four were different significantly based on eth uh, ethnicity. So that means cultural background is significant in the creation of pro-environmental views. And sadly, that's about all I can say on that, uh, just because I don't understand necessarily more. We, we didn't go further into researching uh, what specific cultural backgrounds are creating what. So I just have this broad statement, but hopefully this is a starting point for some future research looking into this more and how cultural background and how, how does it create these pro-environmental views. Personally, I anticipated to see more differences between demographics and views of prairies, um, but such uh, maybe because of the sampling was not as random as it was, um, or the sample size wasn't large enough, um, but more research could be done to do, uh, further my findings. What we found when looking at of different types of people visiting the park, we found 14% of people of color visiting Minneopa. Um, Minnesota's population of people of color is around 20%. So the park is below the national average or before our state average for uh, representation at the park. And this is um, something we see not through state parks, but also throughout the National Park Service as well. Uh, and so I'd like to take some time to talk about that for a second. Um, some other demographic studies found specifically in the national parks um, in 2009 to 2011 that only 22% of visitors were people of color, while the national average is 38%. Um, looking specifically from the Forest Service data, what they found in 2016 is that black or African Americans only account for 1% of the national forest visits in 2010, while Hispanics or Latino account for 7%. National parks, they are often romanticized as America's best idea, 
um, but they should no be noted that they're also one of the whitest. Although little information exists about state parks, at the national level, it is clear to see that part of the problem in attracting diverse populations to the park is this history. Um, you can see this sign that was, uh, no, it's no longer present in Shenandoah National Park, but was what once was, um, just suggesting the, the area for black people. Um, this could be a contributing factor to be why less than a quarter of the national parks and monuments are even recognized to diverse people uh, and cultures. Other factors that deter people of color from visiting the parks, less than a quarter of the national parks and monuments recognize diverse people and cultures. The lack of representation threatens to make these sites increasingly irrelevant to large swaths of the country's population. The country's demographics are rapidly changing, and the Census Bureau estimates the white population will make up less than 50% of the country by 2045. The parks are particularly significant in the current conversations about racism and diversity because they are a venue where the government tells the country's history. For example, um, Superintendent Cassis Cassius Cash at Great Smoky Mountains National Park. He is one of 16 black superintendents in the entire park service, but at the park he is six out of 300 employees that are black. This big problem of the workforce itself being white is found not only at state levels but throughout the, the system itself. The park service has acknowledged uh, the problem and convened a commission during the Obama administration on the future of the service as it approached its 100 year anniversary back in 2016. And it issued a call to action that included a broad commitment to diversity within the service and a broader outreach to communities of color. And so during the Obama administration and the service also added several new national monuments to it, the, uh, its inventory and a few uh, are listed uh, here. As the use of bison as a flagship species referring to the specific reintroduction of bison to Minneopa State Park was successful. The park goal was not only to reach out to the public and introduce a new and exciting new feature, but as well as to teach the public about native mammals. The reach of the information increased as the park had a spike in visitors after the introduction of bison. And now after the initial excitement period, the bison are still serving a purpose as tools for prairie restoration. As we are wrapping up, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the limitations of my project. We um, specifically have low sample size um, for our non-visitor group, um, which provided to be a little bit of a challenge during a statistical analysis. Um, an appropriate comparison group was also challenging to obtain. Um, we uh, Data collection was refused at multiple locations, uh, like the, the mall, the Southern Minnesota's Children's Museum, the Blue Earth County Library, as well as the North Mankato Library. Um, this limited the potential for a larger sample size because it reduced my access to a larger and perhaps a more diverse population. The comparison group were um, probably scientifically oriented people if they were parents of children at the science fair or teachers that brought students there. Um, but then there was also the effect of self-reported data. So when people look at their own opinions and rate them themselves, we have to take their word for it. So uh, we have to um, use that information carefully because uh, we, you hope that people are not lying to you as they're giving your survey. So now, as we're concluding, I want to just restate the goal of this research was to create a survey instrument to measure values, attitudes, and knowledge about prairie ecosystems and prairie conservation. And the results show that the public has a good understanding of the basic functions of the prairie, as well as have concerned about environmental problems. We More investigation is needed to pinpoint exactly which concerns are worrisome to the public. Uh, more research focusing on previous experiences in nature and the importance it relates to forming an attitude could be conducted focused specifically about prairies. Hopefully this novel research will serve as a starting point for the continued research of values, attitudes, and knowledge about prairie ecosystems to then hopefully continue uh, the conservation and restoration processes of prairies occurring here in Minnesota. Thank you Dr. Brittany Smith for advising me through this project. Uh, Scott Kaldaka for 
uh, guiding me through the park and the bison herd information. Um, thanks to the park for allowing me to, to survey. Uh, thank you to the Vondahar family for your um, grant donation. Um, thank you to the bison ambassadors for allowing me a, a spot to um, give out my survey uh, data to or give out my survey at. And then uh, thank you to uh, MSU Mankato, um, the Department of Biological Sciences for a grant as well for this research.